Uh, I'm, I'm curious to know about your, your first meeting with, uh, with John Hughes, if you recall it. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's uh, chronicled in the book called A Star is Found, uh, written by Janet Hershenson and Jane Jenkins. They were the casting directors for many of his films. Hmm. I'll read you something, and then you'll sure. know. Okay? okay. All right. Like most casting directors, Jane and I have our favorites among working actors, people who we think have interesting faces, big talents, and a gift for making the most of the small but juicy parts. Edie McClurg, for example, is the plump, purse-lipped lady with the strong Midwestern accent whom I first cast as Grace, the secretary, in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. She uh, was with the famous comedy troupe known as the Groundlings, and she used to perform her own trademark characters on David Letterman's daytime show. If you watch TV or gone to the movies during the past three decades, you've almost certainly seen her, probably several times. I picked her out immediately for Ferris Bueller because I knew that director John Hughes liked to populate his films with offbeat, distinctive characters. John never considered a small part a throwaway. No good director does. And he was always looking for someone who could contribute an unusual flavor or quirky line delivery. And I'd realized right away that with John, I'd need plenty of backups for every role. He likes to see a lot of people. Hmm. But in Edie's case, I knew it wasn't necessary. Sure enough, as soon as she walked into the audition room, he began to smile. Oh, yeah, I thought. This was meant to be. Edie made even the tiniest role sing, and from then on, whenever we were casting a movie, John would say, okay, here's the Edie part. Or, wait a minute, wait a minute, how are we going to use Edie? So that wow. was uh, high praise indeed. And uh, I did uh, actually five films uh, with John and one film before uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off was Mr. Mom, which he wrote. But sure. He was uh, he didn't have a track record as a director, so they d didn't let him direct that. But uh, then it, that was '83, and then in '86 he did Ferris Bueller and went on to direct. Wow. So w what were your impressions uh, of John Hughes during your creative collaborations? Well, what I really loved about him is that he was very quiet. Uh, he didn't yell or uh, bully you. He would say, uh, what do you think about uh, this here? Could you be doing something here before we get to the written part? And, hmm. you know, I'd suggest something. And um, when we uh, were going to do Ferris, uh, at the time it was, a, it was popular among young uh, actresses, young women, to have long, straight hair. So for me as Sarah, who was playing uh, the girlfriend, uh, Sloan, um, she had this long straight hair, so they hired her hairdresser to blow out her hair every morning, but he didn't know how to do any other kind of hair. He is the perfect foil for that mm -hmm. because he's very meticulous in his uh, sartorial and, uh, and his uh, clothing. Mm -hmm. He's very, very clean <laughs> and, and sh a little shy is the uh, Mr. Um, beautiful, uh, gorgeous, gorgeous Steve Martin. And uh, and then there was John. It was just, you know, his, his shirt tail is always falling out of his pants and, and you know, he's wearing big uh, brogans and just a big presence. And then there's this tiny, slim uh, guy, uh, by his side and gets thrown into that. I I can't think of a better pairing for a comedy film than those two guys and oh, John yeah. put classic. them together. I mean those guys. I mean they're classic and and it's a shame that John's no longer with us because he was just a comic dynamo, a fireball whenever yeah. he was on screen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now that you mentioned planes, trains, uh, I I have to know about your scene because that that is a highlight of that movie for me. Mm -hmm. I watched it again the other night, and I, I was just on the floor laughing at, at that scene. Was that difficult to to uh, to get 
to get through? I would imagine it would be. Well, uh, you know, I was uh, playing my servo mechanism, you know, person behind the desk, and uh, when he walks up to me, I thought just to give him a little more aggravation, I'd be on the phone. And, you know, and just putting up that one finger, which you just hate to see somebody right. do when you try to get something done, you know, just putting up that finger. And uh, what I did is I just picked up the phone and was pretending to do a, uh, a car transaction, you know. Mm-hmm. And we did that for a couple of takes. And then John leaned forward from behind the camera and he said, this time talk about Thanksgiving. And I said, okay. So I just let fly with the monologue that uh, it was even longer and uh, because I had some Catholic references in there that John didn't quite understand, which I thought were incredibly funny, but it, uh, only Catholics would probably get it. Mm-hmm. So he cut that out, but I had added in that, you know, well, we, you know, Mama get up, uh, you know, and get the turkey in, and and uh, we got to get uh, miniature marshmallows for the ambrosia, and then I added, which he took out, um, we got to keep Uncle Billy away from the bourbon and ginger because he's gonna start arguing the virgin birth with Father Ed. <laughs> <laughs> and so I finished off the monologue, and uh, and he said, okay, how do you do? Because the writer in him was saying. How do you do that? I say talk about Thanksgiving. You give me a minute-long monologue. How do you do that? Because he was, like, picking my brain. And I said, I'm a cannibal. That's all about my family. It's all true. <laughs> <laughs> it, sounds, it sounds like he gave you so much freedom, though, as an Oh, actor. he did. Well, the, when I came in to do the uh, – well, what, what I did when I came in for the audition – is the line, you know, the Sportos, the Bloods, the Dweebies, the Dickheads, um, they all adore him. Mm-hmm. He's mm-hmm. very popular. That's the way the line ended on the audition uh, scene. And I added, because I had the, the Chicago accent going, uh-huh. yeah, <laughs> and so I added, they think he's a righteous dude, because I wanted <laughs> to use the word dude with that accent. And John laughed and he put it in the movie wow oh so funny so funny uh looking back on on his career uh what do you think his legacy uh, is well i think up to that point most um movies that had teenagers in them were all written by older people who've forgotten what it was like to be in high school Mm -hmm. And John never forgot what it was like to be in high school. And uh, among that whole list of the dweebies, the dickheads, all of that stuff, uh, after we were, you know, we finished shooting and uh, we were going to turn around and and get the other direction um, with the camera. So we had a few minutes there. And I said, okay, so John, uh, which one of you were in this list? Which one were you? And he looked at me and he said, (laughs) wastoid. No wonder I loved him so much. Yeah. Oh my God! Yeah. yeah. So he yeah. was he was that quiet guy observing everything mm-hmm. in high school. You know. Did you stay in touch with him at all through the years? Or? You know, uh, she's having a baby, which uh, came out in '88. Was actually shot before Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, and Paramount didn't have uh, very much faith in it. And it's actually John's real life story of him and Nancy uh living in the suburbs and him going on the train into into the city to do advertising and shoot uh write advertising copy and mm-hmm. shoot the uh, commercials. Mm-hmm. And then uh he would come home and have dinner and then he would go up and start writing in his little writing room and that's where the first movies M- Mr. Mom came from. Mm-hmm. With him and so that movie is a, a pretty true story, including, you know, the the uh, umbilical cord being wrapped around his first son, John's uh, neck, and not knowing if the baby was going to make it or not. All of that was a true story. Mm-hmm. And um, he, uh, they had called and said, uh, we're going to have a wrap party. It's tonight. Uh, come at about 11 o'clock. 
for a rap party. So I showed up, and there wasn't anyone there at the restaurant. And I said, what's going on? They said, well, they're, you know, they're trying to get their last uh, scene finished, and uh, and they'll be over. And then they came over at midnight, and they said, uh, it's not going to happen. So we all just went home. And later I found out that uh, they, were tr- they were doing that very sensitive scene, and um, the studio shut him down at midnight. They didn't want to pay the overtime. Huh. Mm-hmm. And it was uh-huh. not long after that that he moved back to Chicago. Wow. Yeah. I mean, he had made so much money for them with Ferris Bueller and planes, trains, and automobiles, and then they wouldn't give him another hour. Uh, no, there's such bottom line. Um, just, yeah. It's just ridiculous how <laughs> cheap they are. And and, it, and the, a man that defined an era, but at the same time he made movies that we as adults can can go back to and enjoy, and and children of today can Everything enjoy them too. Thanksgiving people screen planes, trains, and automobiles at their house. Yeah. I know people yeah. who come up to me and they say, "Oh, every Thanksgiving or every Christmas we have to have planes, trains, and automobiles. We just have to." Absolutely. And it's a, it's of course. A, it's a tradition in whole families. We yeah. all get together, and, and or and he did the he did the same thing with the 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 Christmas vacation. The, yeah, with those production work. Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, and uh, that you that somebody this one guy could resonate so broadly with so many people, and he was the most unassuming person. And he loved his wife and family. He met his wife in high school. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, you know, were a couple so much in love all their lives. And uh, he, um, he loved his boys so much. And he saw what was happening. Uh, you know, they went to a privileged school, and they were around privileged children of privileged parents. Mm-hmm. And he didn't like what he was seeing happen to them and their personalities. Mm-hmm. And being, you know, uh, rich kids of a famous father, he he couldn't stand that, and that's another reason that they moved back to mm-hmm. the Midwest. He didn't want them raised around that kind of. You're better just because you're my son. No. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's very yeah. sen- that was very sensible of him. Mm-hmm. Very and it's and it's a, it's a great loss for for all of us. And it is. Thank goodness we we. We'll always have those films, and and they will survive forever, uh, for as long I mean, as they're. How many movies. other, you know, uh, a trendy type of film do you see twenty five, thirty years later, mm-hmm. and it's still understood, and it still resonates with the the teenagers of today? It's how still could got, that happen? Yeah, it's still got that universal it's, appeal and that emotional re- yeah. resonance. That's yeah. what it has. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. And it was written by a guy who could remember what it felt like to be 14, 15, 16 mm-hmm. years old. And it wasn't some old guy, you know, hacking out a script where he thinks kids talk this way. No. Mm-hmm. He mm-hmm. had his ear open all of his life, and he could he could bring right. it back at any point. Yeah. What an artist. Yeah, very much so. Mm-hmm. Edie, thank, thank you so much for calling in and participating. I, I hope we get to welcome you on in the future for, for a happier occasion. But yes. I appreciate your time so much. Yes. Thank okay, you very thank much. Thank you, boys. Bye-bye.